Ollie Ollie Oxen Free movie fans, because ready or not, you're up for another episode of Anatomy of a Movie. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Anatomy of a Movie. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, movie fans. This I am your host, Dimitri Panos, for Popcorn Talk Network's Anatomy of a Movie. And yes, we do talk movies. Hey, I am so stoked today because I'm getting to introduce to you, number one, co-host Tara Erickson, who's bring you to the show. Hi, guys. So please say hello. It's me, Tara Erickson. You know me through AfterBuzz, but I'm new here to Anatomy of a Movie. And very glad to have <laughs> you. Happy to and be here. Already, already Tara has, has more than proven her, her, her gravitas to the show because it was her diligence and hard work that we have a very special show today. Number one, if you couldn't get from the cold open, we're going to be talking about Ready or Not the movie, okay? So, but not just, I mean, Tara and I could do this all on our own, but Tara went the extra 500 miles, <laughs> and we're actually going to be talking with co-director Tyler Gillette. Tyler, say hello. Hey, hey. everybody. <laughs> so happy to be here. You know, and we're very happy to have you. This is uh, this is a treat and an honor. Uh, we are a, basically, we're a review show. I'm not sure what Tara told you. I don't want to... Uh, 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 like be redundant, but we're an in-depth re- review show. We go above and above, <laughs> uh, uh, above and beyond opinion, and we talk about the making of the movie uh, because many fans like to not only like give their opinions with one another, like they'll go see the movie, then they go to their bar or restaurant or home, and they start talking about the movie. And this is what anatomy of a movie does. We talk about production. We talk about the collaborative effort that it is to bring a movie on screen. So uh, it's great to have somebody from the inside because he's deep, deep, deep inside (laughs) as a co-director. So he'll be able to tell us like so much about Ready or Not that go above and beyond production notes and even articles that we've read and the research we did. So Tyler, thank you very, very much for being here. Yeah, it's an honor, and uh, I love I love talking movies. So, <laughs> whatever funny. whatever you guys have, whatever you want to ask, I, I I am I am an open book. Well, you know, Tara, I want you to start this off because it was because of your due diligence and oh, hard work. I'm just gonna get and, right into yeah, it, please huh? Do. Yeah. Well, I just I had a fun to. question. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, what was your most favorite scene that you shot in the movie where you yelled "cut" and you were like, "That's the money shot." I have a feeling you might say the end, but I don't know. I just want to know. Because I know you and Matt like kind of share a brain, right? And then you have Chad on the side producing. So I feel like with three people involved, um, there might be some, like, not arguments, but conversations to be had. But I'm wondering if there was ever a shot where you all three came together and you're like, cut the check. I, I mean, look. If you've seen the movie, you know that there are so many insane moments and insane gags and set pieces and insane performances. And it's it's um, I'm not sure if there's one in particular that sticks out. You know, the ending, actually, because uh, so much of what we how we shot that was practical. Um, it was actually very technical. It's sort of you get excited when the the technical part of it actually works because uh, there are so many variables and so many things that can go wrong. But I, I think for us, you know, we were always just um, we were just blown away by our cast. Every every time we would show up in a scene, and you know, we were we were a very very short schedule. We had to shoot really quick. I think the most takes we had of anything was three, and even that was rare. Um, I think that we always were just blown away when we actually pulled off a scene because there was so much dialogue and so much coverage and. And, you know, so many, so much movement within the scene and so much to do with the camera. Um, I I think every scene uh, when we were walking away, we were sort of pinching ourselves like, holy shit, did we actually, (laughs) did we actually just pull it off? That's awesome. Um, So, so I, I I would say, I mean, I know I don't, I don't mean to dodge and I can, I can talk specifically about moments that I really love in depth, but it was, um, it was a real, 
I think making any movie is a is a collection of of small miracles. Like it, it takes a lot of a lot of just serendipity and and things going your way to pull it off at all. And um, we certainly had had all of that on our side <laughs> on this project. Yeah, that's not dodging the question at all. Something else, Tyler and the audience. Uh, and you, Tara, for being uh, first on. Uh, we have Ryan in the booth, by the way, who's already familiar with the show. He made his debut next to me last week on Blinded by the Light. That's but he, right. he handles our zeros and ones and our sound makes sure that we look good. That's why my camera is masked. Um, <laughs> in any case, uh, so when we're talking about movies, we, we are a... We, we talk spoilers. Okay, mm -hmm. so... Okay. Uh, this so it's okay. Uh, I'm warning the audience. Uh, by this time, um, you know the movie's been out. Hope you've seen it once, maybe even twice. Hell, even a third time. So <clears throat> we are a spoiler-rich show because, like I said, it's as if we just watched the movie and now we're talking about it. So don't worry about giving anything about the ending away or any plot points or twists. Uh, audience you've been warned if you haven't seen the movie well why the hell not number one number two put it on pause because this is one discussion you're going to want to be a part of but you can't do it unless you watch the movie so watch the movie come back Spoiler there, alert. there we go Spoiler shields alert. up Spoiler ready the phasers alert. and Spoiler come back and then take us off pause and then you too can be part of the discussion and we do uh encourage you to write in on YouTube, uh, tell us what you think. We want to hear your comments as well. So, uh, Tyler, before I start getting into the movie, I want I want the audience to get a great feel about you because many people who do tune in and listen, they want a career within this biz called show. And so you're from Flagstaff, Arizona. You went to uh, University of Arizona for film school. Um, how important was film school or for you, what what classes did you take uh, that that brought you into say at being a camera operator uh, on what was it semi tough I believe so yeah I, I mean I I had an, I had an incredible experience at film school I think that um, you know for me for me a, a formal education in in the arts was really more about um, I mean certainly learning the critical study side of thing I think is valuable learning about how to have how to have conversations about movies, why the things that are that are successful are successful. And, um, you know, so much of what works and, and what is um, great about good storytelling is not accidental. Right. It's right. It, it, years of craft goes into to um, to making a moment work. And so I, I think that certainly there was there was that just getting a sense of the value of um of all of the different parts of, of the production that go into making something um, something great, but I think more than anything, it was about discipline, you know, and, and really um, uh, getting a, getting a sense early on of what it takes to uh, to complete a project. Uh, it's very easy to start something; it's it's very hard to finish it. And in, in film school, you know, you you are accountable to a lot of people. You're accountable to your classmates, to your professors, to a grade. And so it was, um, I think, I think a valuable experience in, um, in just, in just teaching, teaching me the discipline of, uh, of finishing a project. Yeah. Um, and, and I was very lucky after school to, uh, to kind of have a second, a second film school when I met, um, when I met up with, with Chad and Matt, uh, I consider that <laughs> I, I consider our, our collaboration to really be a film school as well. You know, we, right. Um, we came up in the days, early days of YouTube, uh, and we were just DIY filmmakers. You know, Chad, Chad and Matt had been working together um, as Chad, Matt, and Rob, this really just fucking fantastic um, kind of action adventure comedy group. And I connected with them uh, one summer 10 years ago, and we've been working together ever since. And, and it was a, you know, it, it was in its earliest days, it was all hands on deck. We did everything from writing the script to, to mixing the sound to, to you know the craft service i mean there was there was no part of the process that we didn't touch and and um i think uh i think that was also just wildly wildly formative on a technical level we learned how how to make a movie yeah and um and so yeah i i you know i think that um 
certainly the critical study side is important, but the making of things, that's, that's when you realize what it, what it takes and what it is to, you know, to create, and to create a story. When did you decide I'm going to Los Angeles? Come well, my LA. family, my family is all from here. So, okay. I, you know, my parents were born and raised east of, east of LA and, um, my grandparents live out here. And so mm -hmm. it was, it was always, it always felt a little bit like, uh, going home to a certain extent because I spent so much of my so many of my summers out out here with my family. Um, but I I knew I wanted to make movies from from very very early on, and I and I and I wanted to do photography as well. That was a big part of it. I I, um, I also studied photography in school, and so that was kind of my in to the uh, to the business in a lot of ways. I came up you know sort of vocationally, you could say, you know, as a as a camera operator, as a film loader, as a as an AC. And, um, and found that while I was behind the camera as an operator, um, with, with working with Chad and Matt, that, you know, I was doing a lot of, a lot of directing. And so it sort of evolved, this love of directing really evolved naturally out of, out of the technical side of, of, um, of the process. That's fantastic. Um, I want to ask you too, because you, you, you said you were a DP, uh, I, I always believe that a director, aside from his crew and the cast, but he heavily relies on DP and editor, uh, and 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 conversation between these three people. I, I always found to be very integral. What did you take from being a DP and then making that leap into being a director? What do you take with you um, from from cinematography? Like, you already have sense of camera, which is great. Um, but you hear sometimes like um, um, when Harold Ramis was directing Caddyshack, he had no idea. He'd never directed anything in his life. And he would put a camera down on the golf course and the DP would come over to him and say, you're going to want to move your camera. And he's like, why? He goes, well, the sun's coming up over there and you're going to lose your shot. So. Obviously, being a DP must have helped you a lot in, in making in becoming a director. So what yeah. are the most important traits? Hugely, hugely so. I mean, I think I think a large part of it for for um, for me was just uh, having an understanding of what is and isn't possible. You know, we, we, <laughs> we were sort of starting out. There was a certain <laughs> there was a certain level of naivete in the way that we approached the process that I actually think is really it was really valuable in us, you know, figuring out and, and discovering our voice. And we certainly understood, you know, Chad and Matt and I, the kind of the, the rules of, of filmmaking and cinematography and how to compose a shot and how to, you know, how to design a scene and how to edit, you know, cross coverage and all of those kind of, you know, basic technical tools. But um, I think that coming up as a DP, what I learned, what I learned really early on is that it doesn't take much to capture a great story that certainly like there are, there are levels of technical proficiency that are like, that are absolutely mind boggling. And our, our DP on ready or not, Brett Jukowitz is a great example of that. He, he pulled off shit on this movie that I, I, I still just scratch my head, like on a technical lighting design level. I'm like, well, that's, that's not something I'd ever, <laughs> I would ever be able to accomplish. That's like, you know, that's, that's his, his true love. Right. But, you know, coming, coming up through camera, I think, um, it really influenced the style, uh, of how Matt and I direct, you know, we came up really run and gun. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, a lot of time to set up lights. And so it was really about, um, it was really about shooting things as naturalistically as possible and adding the camera to the scenes last. Right. right. Not not um, not blocking super specifically for a frame, but instead allowing the allowing the, the action and the performance to really exist and the camera to be the thing that's swinging around and capturing it. Right. Um, which which is certainly, I think, evident in Ready or Not. There are a lot of moments yeah. where it feels really frenetic and it feels like you're not on a stage. Right. The, there's a world existing on the periphery of the frame and the camera isn't afraid to, to pivot and see that world at any moment. Right. And that was really, that was really just that style, I think was really born out of just understanding, um, the basics of how to, how to use a camera and, um, and, 
and how it's really a tool and it can be used in so many ways. But for us, it was about like a tool to capture as much fun, awesome information as possible in as short amount of time right. as, as possible. Tara, we were talking before you said you had had a cinematography or DP question. Oh, I so. just wanted to ask if it was the first time that you worked with this DP, because I know that you guys on Southbound and other movies, you know, you guys have done the editing yourselves and you said that you've run camera before. So this is the first time that you've worked with this DP? Yeah, this was the okay. first time we worked with this DP. This is the first time we shot in any of our projects uh, with the, with the DP. I've I've shot uh, operated and shot all of our previous work. So it was a um, it was a really interesting it was a really interesting process. I think there was a lot of um, there was a lot of I, I would I wouldn't even say anxiety. I think there was a lot of just the apprehension about like ooh are we are we releasing this amount of control to the right to the right <laughs> person? And ultimately, he came in and was just I mean right off the bat was just like oh shit we're we're in we're in good hands. We well, made the right decision. Well, yeah. the movie looked great, um, and and it's funny that you mentioned that there aren't that many. Uh, the one that comes to mind to me directors who were cinematographers uh, Peter Hines. Uh, yeah, DP. Soderbergh as well. Soderbergh yeah. is an operator. Like he operated camera on all of his. I, I, he still does yeah. as well. He's so very much. I you know, always find that amazing. So I want to talk now too about Ready or Not, because I think there's a, a, a ton to dive into. Um, number one, uh, influences. When you're coming up with this, outside of Rosemary's Baby, which I've read a lot, but I want to hear what else went into the pot when you were coming up with this story. Uh, as movie lovers, uh, for Ready or Not? Yeah, it's a really good question because I, I think that um, the first thing that really jumps out uh, to people, um, and it's what jumped out to us when we were reading the script, is that Ready or Not does this, it has this ability to pivot between tones really seamlessly. And about. it's not just one thing. It's it's um, it's a movie that is a, a real mix of of many genres and all genres that that we love uh, that somehow miraculously come together to like, feel, feel like a singular, mm -hmm. <laughs> a singular thing. And so for us, it was, um, you know, usually when you go in and you're like pitching a movie to the studio, you talk really specifically about comps and about, you know, what the movie feels like. This is our comps for this when we were talking about influences were just all over the fucking map. It was like, <laughs> we talked about Rosemary's Baby. We talked about The Shining. We talked about Jaws. We talked about Fargo. We were, it was just this, this insane, weird mix of things that all were representative of different parts of what we loved about the movie. But we also knew that because there was no one movie that was like, oh, this is this, is this that we were onto something new, that there was something really unique and original about, <laughs> about the tone. Um, and, you know, to, to the credit of, of Searchlight, they usually, you know, studios have a tendency to want to, to want to narrow, to really squeeze the guardrails in and narrow what the movie is tonally. So they can know specifically how to market it. And, and, and the more specific it is, the easier it is to like, get it out to a certain audience. And Searchlight was the opposite. They were like, we, we love all of the weirdness of this. And, and want to push it in, in in into the extremes of its of its unique identity. Um, so we were we got really lucky with that. Right. It's it's rare that that happens. I have to ask because one movie in my discussion, uh, like whether on Meet the Movie Press, another show that I've mm -hmm. done, uh, a movie that came up a lot. And personally, uh, I'm somewhat of a fan, but I'm more of a um, murder by death fan. But a movie that came up a lot was Clue. Clue. I knew it. Clue. I knew he was going to say that. And I was like, I'm so surprised that you haven't said Clue yet. Especially because I wrote down that the pepper oh. box revolver like that Emily had has been like the, the oldest, you know, the gun used in Clue since like 1972. So, yeah, I agree with that question. Yeah, Clue absolutely was a huge. I mean, our original um, our original artwork that we used to pitch to the studio, we took a uh, we took the original um, board game box for Clue, and, <laughs> and appropriated it and used redesigned it to fit to fit the tone of the movie. So it was we you know we we changed the we changed all the artwork on the cover of the box, the text to say Ready or Not instead of Clue, obviously, and then we we changed all the other text to kind of fit and feel like thematically and you know conceptually what the movie was about, and then you know using using just our our you know kind of novice. Photoshop skills added blood splatters to the <laughs> <laughs> to the cover of it, so it was immediately the tone was immediately clear. You didn't have a copy was, of that handy to show us, do so you? 
<laughs> That'd be great if he had a copy of that to show us. That, oh. that sounds awesome. Yeah. Oh, I um, want so badly to release it. It's like <laughs> you work so hard on these materials when you're pitching a movie, and then when you we, like when it actually gets made miraculously, you realize that you've been using materials that are all copyrighted. And, right. and so the, the legal process and like releasing something like that online is right. just insane for people. But it may someday, maybe, maybe in the distant I, I, future. I hope. When- and, and again, I say, look, much respect to Clue. I'm a big murder by death fan. So I'm Neil Simon. I'm the, 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 the classic cast. So um, I do have a, I'm going to, I'm going to change tones because I, I, speaking of tones, I do want to talk about your blending of horror and comedy before yeah. I get into that. Um, I want to talk about, uh, I'm sure you've heard about the movie, The Hunt. Yes. And so, so this movie, The Hunt, um, it was pulled from release, has, people can make an argument that there's a similar theme, at least people hunting people, people hunting somebody. Uh, when that movie got pulled, were you folks concerned about that? Did it concern, yeah, did it concern you? Um. And the release of your movie? I, it concerned us, but I, it didn't. It didn't concern us. We didn't have concern for the release of our movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that our concerns were, our concerns were uh, were more about what that what that says about where we're at culturally and, and politically. That um, that something can be made uh, and that no one can see it, and that we can all somehow culturally have an opinion about about that um, before we've before we've had a chance to actually weigh in and and understand what uh what kind of conversation that that piece of art is is trying to have um so i that that concerned us right that's a bit of a slippery slope like if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna pull a movie out of theaters um for for whatever reason uh and and i should i should preface all of this by saying i i have not seen the hunt so i don't know i can't speak to what the movie what the movie is is or isn't but um, I certainly am a, a fan of Lindelof and a fan of, of Zobel, and they are smart, um, articulate, sensitive storytellers. I, I think that their past work kind of speaks for itself in that regard. And I have to, I have to believe that there was probably some something of value in that in that project. And it's unfortunate that um, that we don't get to that we don't get to have that that conversation. Uh, I, I agree, but. Ready is like it's. I wouldn't. I mean, ready or not, certainly not apolitical. But no, I, I, right. it's. We're not making a point of it of being political, which I think is the difference, really. Right. Yeah, I was. I was actually quite surprised. Um, you know, I mean, it's also a Blumhouse movie, mm-hmm. uh, put out by a big studio, uh, Universal, and um, you couldn't help if you're a movie fan and you pay attention to these sort of things that seeing what was happening to the hunt are people going to make these dopey comparisons right and when you have people like you know the person who's supposed to be leading this country tweeting about something that he and or staff have never seen and it's all hearsay it it really does go show like pop media and how it can be affected by by pure rumor and and by people i call them the internet trolls because people will have an opinion about something without even having seen it yet Mm -hmm. and it's so hurtful i think to uh, as a moviegoer um to art itself uh you you should let it play like they said in bad news bears and breaking training let them play and have it out there and make up your own mind. Don't have somebody tell you whether it be the commander in chief or some internet troll. So, yeah, and we vote with our dollars, right? right. That's what the that's, that's it. What business is. Um, Absolutely. It's, if it's not something that you that you feel interested in in letting into your life, then then um, don't do it. No, you got more power to you. Don't you know? Yep. Don't don't let it in. Don't let it into your life. Right. I, I think that's. Um, but I think I think that. Um, you know, there not enough responsibility and ownership is being taken on the part of on the part of you know the viewers <laughs> so, <laughs> to censor censor themselves I, and censor what they you know what they agree and disagree with. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about something a little more fun. Uh, I want to talk about the blending of horror and comedy. Uh, it's been done through the ages. Whether you're a big Abbott and Costello fan, whether you like John Landis and American Werewolf in London, uh, or whether you like Robert Zemeckis, Death Becomes Her. Um, it's a very tough thing to do, yeah. Uh, in my opinion, uh, because you're you're putting together these two genres that are so far apart from one another. And I, I guess you can also say 
I think that really good horror isn't really good unless there's a little bit of levity in it to mm-hmm. give you a breather and then bring you back in again and terrify the crap out of you. But there are those movies uh, that, that do... It's a fine balancing act. How hard was that for you to, to walk that tightrope? Was yeah. it difficult for you? Uh, and, and how did you get... What were you, how did you get around it? How did you walk that tightrope? Well, I, look, it, that tightrope was something we started walking just, it was the first, it was the first challenge of this project was, um, having, having, figuring out how to articulate the tone and, um, how to have a conversation about it in a way that sold, that sold what it was honestly to people, because it's, it's, it's easy to say horror comedy, but it's also wildly reductive, right? Like horror comedy is, can be so, so many, right. so many things. Um, it can be that can be camp that can be, you know, parody that can be satire. So it was it was finding finding a way to um, to really have the, the right kind of conversation about what it was tonally. And ultimately, the script, uh, you know, written by Guy Busick and Ryan Christopher Murphy um, mm-hmm. was the, the blueprint for that. I mean, what what the movie is tonally was really well represented from the earliest, earliest drafts of the script. Right. It was what really drew us to the to the project this kind of insane mix of of genre elements and and comedy um and you know the the tightrope the the way that we've always walked that tightrope and if you go back and you watch some of our earlier earlier work um it's i would say that um it's present in all of in all of that stuff and and in a lot of ways ready or not was kind of a return to a to a style of filmmaking and and a tone for us um for us, it's all about it's all about walking into the craziness of of a story with a character who you relate to, and then putting that character into a situation that they're just wildly unprepared to deal with. Right, right. Like we 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 aren't we aren't like the setup setup punchline kind of storytellers. We're more about the situational and character based humor. Um, that's how that's how those tones have always co- coexisted really really well for us. Um, and, and then, you know, I I think to that same point, um, having an ensemble that represents a different range of tonalities was all really valuable, specifically for this movie that you have on played by Nikki Godogny at one end. And she's like batshit crazy, right? (laughs) She is, she is the guardrail to the far, (laughs) to the farthest, farthest degree. And then the other, the other end of that is you have Adam Brody who plays Daniel and Mark O'Brien who play Alex, who are, who are these like, you know, deeply, deeply saddened characters. They've, they, they're really struggling with who they are and who they are in this family and what, what the past has, has done to them. And Within that, you, you get to represent such a such a wide variety of perspectives and and tones that um, that it all somehow seems to work. And and then you have a great cast who right. who own those characters. They play them from a from a place of being incredibly grounded. Nobody is doing the silly superficial arch version of their character. I mean, Melanie Scrofano, who plays Emily, she she is so off the rails with her cocaine and drug use, but she always feels, it always feels real. It always feels like she's behaving in a way that's, that's real to her upbringing and real to her experience. And so all of those, all of those things start to work together to create a world that feels, um, it feels really lived in and really believable. And that's, that for us is where the best, that's how to walk that tight. Right. Great. Terrible. Since you said you had three takes, normally in the third, because I heard that Andy McDowell was the one who improvised Totally Dick and something about Give Me the Fucking Lanterns, which yeah. I thought was great. It seems like you guys run a really fun set that it's kind of like maybe, do you do like two takes and then on the third, or you just like kind of make it your own where everyone can kind of add in what they want? Or um, did, was that just like, oh, just happenstance with Andy? Um, I, it's, we show up pretty, pretty prepared and pretty on book. I mean, we have to be when we're on such a tight schedule, but, and this is to the credit of the cast, you know, everyone came in and, um, the, the writing was so great and so specific for each character that it was always really clear who they were, but the cast from, from, you know, in, in every role, even Georgie and Gabe played by, you know, uh, Ethan Tavares and Liam McDonald, like they, they brought a, a real, um, a real sense of life and humanity to those characters. And 
I think that people feel felt like um, they could take some chances. Like it was the characters and their approaches were were so respected by us, of course, because oh my god, we had this insane cast. But there was, I think, there was an opportunity um, for everyone to really to really bring something new and interesting to it. And as long as the core, as long as the core conceit of the scene. Uh, is is intact as long as the the information the narrative information that you need to push the story and the character arcs forward is is present and accounted for then all of all of the stuff around that we think is fair game in terms of how to how to play it and so we were you know we're, we're pretty we're pretty focused on making sure that that like the core stuff is really dialed in and is working and anything outside of that is it's it's a free for all. <laughs> who was uh, speaking of cast? Who was the hardest? Which character was the hardest to cast for you? Oh man, um, you know they were all they were all pretty tricky to cast, but only because we were we were um, really late to the casting process. Uh, we after Samara we even got on board. You know she was our first. Like you have to build the movie around around Grace, right? That's the She's the foundation of of everything. Um, it, the the movie sort of sits <laughs> sits on uh-huh. her shoulders, she and carries um, it well. And I remember we walk we'd walk into our our production office up in Toronto, and uh, the first thing that you'd see when you'd walk in would be our cast board, and you know you it's it's the name of the character, and then a headshot of the actor who's playing them, and there are like fifteen speaking roles in this movie, and. Up until like the final week of pre-production, Sam Samara Weaving's <laughs> headshot was the only headshot on that wall. <laughs> so it was like you'd walk in, you'd walk into the office to a panic attack, and you'd leave the office to a panic attack. But you know, uh, I think I think one of the things was uh, that was great is that the script was so specific that when we found when we found actors who read it and loved it, we knew they loved it for the same reason. There was no way you could read you could read this script. And and feel like eh, I don't know about it. You know, it's like you either you know exactly what That's it is great. from from the first page, and thankfully, you know, having that having that as a compass, I think, really guided the right people to to the project okay. in a lot of ways. Well, we we I know uh, from what I understand, we we're running a, a little a little bit out of time, but I want to two final questions. One, Tara, if you have a final question. And- um, um, sure. I just wanted to say that, I mean, I think Samara makes a really great final girl. I'm wondering if in the beginning of the script when she's actually smoking and kind of like she's not being like a totally pristine, normally like horror genre final girl. Um, she is at the, obviously at the end. Was that already written in or was that a, a direction? I assumed it was in the script, but um, I wanted to to ask. Yeah, no, it was it was written in. And, you know, one of the things that um there was this sort of perfect, perfect marriage of the script and then and then Sam's interpretation of of who she wanted Grace to be. Um, we actually really loved the idea that the script uh, in so many ways is trying to subvert the trope of of what the final girl is, right? That it's not about this this, you know, perfect, you know, pure damsel in distress that by the end of the movie is gonna like find this strength inside of her. Grace is a character that's fucking strong from the start. Right. She's been through some shit, right? She's she's been in foster homes. She's lived on the street. She's probably had to fight somebody for for a meal. Like she's she's a girl who who can fucking scrap and hold her own. And then it's the movie's job, it's the story's job, and it's the family's job to stack an infinite number of obstacles in front of her that she has to that she has to get through to survive. And um, that was. Uh, I think we're 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 so we're so proud of that in the script, and we're so proud of how Sam uh, how Sam brought that to life. We mm-hmm. love that Grace is smart and resourceful, and she does the thing that a normal person would do in that situation. We think that's a really important. Um, it's really important for keeping keeping the audience on on her side, but also just creating a a series of of um, of struggles that feel believable and. Mm-hmm. And uh, and like there's like there's a lot at stake. Yeah. yeah, it's it's weird as a horror fan, to be honest. And I'm, you might think I'm way out of left field on this, but I didn't even look at Grace as being the final girl yeah. character because I looked at the movie in a sense, too. It was almost like an action movie. She had all these obstacles to 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 overcome. Mm-hmm. And for me, the final girl is usually in a situation like 
Grace at a point knew she was being hunted, like by this family. To me, the final girl, like a Laurie Strode, is unaware as of why. Like, why is this happening? My friends are getting killed all around me, all this. And I looked at at Grace as being more or less, a, a for lack of better words, a, a heroine who had to survive what's being, like, like this set of circumstances around her. Mm-hmm. And whether it be going into a dumb waiter, fighting off. Like, I looked at her more of, as an action hero, uh, in a sense, other than, like a final, like 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 a final girl or a scream queen, yeah. mm-hmm. because she was so yeah. great. So Die Hard, Die Hard was another reference, another movie yeah. that we talked about a lot, um, yeah. and, and and in a lot of ways, right? That's that's John McClane taking out a, right. <laughs> a building, a building full of people trying to kill him, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then and and on a and on a costuming level too, we talked a lot about um, his white tank top as a <laughs> you know as a as a as a comp for the wedding dress and how it. You know, you really see the character in in their costuming wear the experience of the right. <laughs> of the night. Yeah. Shoot the glass, which is exactly what you did with her. I mean, I know you guys went through seventeen wedding dresses to get the the acclimation of like exactly where she was in the film, just the mood and yeah. every step, which I thought was great. Well, I yeah, think ending the character on that dress. <laughs> I think ending on a Die Hard reference is the perfect way. <laughs> I agree. To end, uh, as well as to say. Again, Tyler, I, I cannot thank you enough for the time you donated uh, to us today. I, I, I could go on with you for at least another 45 minutes. <laughs> I want to talk about like the house and your setting, but maybe some other time, uh, maybe when the yeah, Blu-ray uh, comes out. I know Chad and Matt would love to would love to jump on sometime with all of us, with all the, of you and let's well, let's let's put it together. Yeah, yeah we'll really, figure let's do it the out Blu-ray for sure. Release when it comes yeah. out, we'll promote the hell out of that because there's so much to talk about, but man, you were great, and and what I love about talking with directors is the way that directors speak and tell stories. And Tyler, you were gracious for coming on. Uh, we're uh, humbled and honored that you were here. Your stories are fantastic. Please, you're always uh, you're always welcome to come back and chat movies with us, whether it's something you directed or something that you want to just talk about. That would Absolutely. be awesome. Absolutely. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for having me, and thank you guys for for the support. It it really. I mean, you never, you know, you, you never know. You only can make something that's a reflection of your taste. And when you, when you realize that other people share that, I, and that's the highest, the highest compliment you can be paid. So thank you so much for, you. for, the, for going out and checking out the movie. Our pleasure. You're awesome, Tyler. True. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. Mario. Have a great time. Yeah, have a great okay. day. Good weekend. Bye. Bye. Wow. That's all I can say. So awesome. Is, thank you. Tara, because, you know, if I woke up this morning and somebody <laughs> said, hey, we're going to have the director of the movie you're going to talk about today. So my first question was, did I like the movie? What? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was... That was awesome. That was, it was, was awesome. This is yes. Ryan in the booth. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Such a great, such an interesting interview. I mean, how awesome is it that uh, an original film of 2019 and I really hope people go mm-hmm. out and support it. Everyone's always complaining about not having any original movies anymore, but when they come out, you, you gotta go support them. Yeah. Yeah. And it is his in house to speak. I mean, he, he did what we did. I mean, <laughs> when he talked about DPing, yeah. And I mean, like, we could only cover. Like, you know, we only have a fine gloss. You can only scratch the surface on that. And he was fantastic. He was great. So and it was amazing. Yeah, I'm, I was super glad that they they that he agreed. And Radio Science is their production company, yeah. for those of you guys who want to look more into it. They started out directing interactive features, uh, uh, adventures on YouTube. So Yeah, I mean, again, there's so much to talk to him about. Because speaking of comedy and, uh, you know, horror, I mean, he worked. He made shorts for uh, Upright Citizens Brigade. Yeah. He worked for... So that, to me... Again, going back to the blending, comedy is a dance uh, that's well timed. You need to, for the joke to stick, it needs to hit a perfect. It has to hit at that perfect spot, and your actors have to carry it off. For horror, it's a little bit different. Again, it's still a dance as to the director ratcheting up tension, when to let the audience go, or how long do you keep them on that hook before you scare them out of their socks and seats. And the blending here, it had it, and it had some gore, and it had some, like, what the fuck moments. Yeah. So I want to, you know, he's got to come back, because I got to talk comedy with him, (laughs) and got to talk, I I wanted to know about, too, the sets, because, again, 
I loved how we talked about the cinematography in shooting within that house. Because right. a lot of the lighting seemed to be a lot of candle lit, right. natural lighting, which lent to the suspense and the direness of it yeah. all. Because it was all... Well, it's actually dead by dawn. Three different locations, two like museum historical places, and then one room that they built. And they they only built the goat pit, which you'll see. But um, yeah, because they could only get one room with actual practical coverage with blood. Obviously, in these museum of homes, they couldn't do the rest, and they don't like CG blood. They didn't want to use it, which is why I think the last scene is so great because it is all practical, and you're just like. Yes, that's what I came here for. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's great. And the movie does not shy away from blood, particularly at the end, right of, of the movie. And there's, I mean, yeah, sure, the, copious the, amounts of, of, of blood, blood at the end, but <laughs> throughout too. Yeah, yeah. Totally. so uh, in the goat room, I half expected a surprise special guest from the goat from the witch to show up. Mm-hmm. Didn't happen, but you know, uh, a crazy scene nonetheless. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, so ready or not, the other thing I wanted to talk to him is about brevity. Movies like 95 minutes long. Yeah. And, you know, in a summer where we've been having movies broaching, like, it is two, it chapter two is two hours and 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is three hours. Yeah. They're just talking about the Irishman being three and a half hours. Now, look, folks... You know me, I've said this before, I don't care what your runtime is, just make the movie damn good, Yeah. because a 90 minute movie can feel like three hours, and a three hour movie, if it's really good, can feel like the time flew by, mm-hmm. and you don't even know, and then vice versa. So, uh, you know, but in this summer, 95 minutes was the perfect distraction for me. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, I I loved it. I mean, and specifically with this film, uh, you are kind of like on the edge of your seat, but also just having a blast at the same time. Um, I mean, there's so many things that happen. Aunt Helene and I don't have the actor's name. um, uh, Just at the very top when she's hiding in their bedroom, she's like, you'll have to hide better than that. You're like, what? This is hilarious. (laughs) Like, it's just so fun and funny right off the bat, uh, which I I just was like, I'm going to adore this movie yeah it it, it, for for this summer it works because number one for me anyways yeah a lot of the tentpole franchise movies it it was a summer of meh yeah me yeah and i think in part because there wasn't a lot of something original Mm -hmm. so I tended to gravitate towards things that I haven't necessarily seen before. Right. And I'm a big horror fan. So the trailer pulled me in from the get go. Yeah. I was really looking forward to it. So again, for 95 minutes, it was the perfect summer distraction. It's very rated R, Mm -hmm. which again, lot, lot of studios shy away from making an R rated movie. And, this being Fox Searchlight, which is now under Disney, mm-hmm. right? It's weird to see that on Wikipedia. Sort of, kind of. And it's also weird. Disney Disney has no idea how to release a movie. Like, it's just, it's not in their wheelhouse anymore. It used to be in the 80s, not today. So bringing in Fox Searchlight, you know, is really smart because this is going to allow them to not be... Marvel 24-7. Right. So I don't need Marvel 24-7. I got nothing against Marvel. Don't get me wrong, but it's nice to see something else. Yeah, I especially agree. Especially this summer. Yeah, let's so, get down and dirty. Let's yeah. see some blood, some action. Some blood, some action. I think Crawl is another great example mm-hmm. of this summer. But ready or not, you know, right from the trailers, you know, got you hooked. And I'm glad that we talked about Clue. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That pops up. And they use, like, six methods of murder in Clue that happen in this movie. And like I said, you know, all the weapons that you see in this movie are just like, Clue, <laughs> Clue, Clue. It's so great. And they just, it's so exciting. Well, every time I talked about this movie, somebody brought up Clue. Yeah. And, again, no disrespect to Clue. It's, it's a fine film. It's slapstick comedy, which this movie isn't exactly slapstick comedy so if you did go in expecting clue 
uh, right. you, you, you might have been a little bit disappointed. I like what you brought up. I mean, you make that great parallel of the methods of murder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this isn't a mystery. They want to kill her. <laughs> and um, here's something I'll, I'll, I want to throw to you or ask you is about, so we need to get this done by dawn. Before oh, yes. sun up. And, you know, if not, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. This needs to be done. <laughs> and about halfway through the movie, I'm thinking to myself, is this all bunk? Like, am right. I, like this is baloney, right? Like, this, this can't, like, Grace has to be thinking, like, Grace is like, what the hell? Like, seriously? Like, you really think? And, like, they're not telling us they made a deal with the devil, right. but they're telling us they made a deal with the devil. And you're like... Yeah, okay. Which is even the family might not right. might think it's bullshit because you pick up Finch typing into his phone. First of all, getting to know your crossbow move. Hilarious. I laughed out loud yeah. for like a good full minute. But you do catch him <laughs> later. It's a nice callback to him, Finch being on his phone in the bathroom. Right. Is satanic family like game hide and seek bullshit. Right. Uh, which I thought is hilarious because he didn't even know. He's just like, I don't know. They made me play old maid. Um, and so uh, I think all, everybody is on the same page except when you get to the very end, I think we're all just being like, oh, yeah, I mean, that's a game. And then you're like, oh, now they explain it, which I I loved how they... They kind of, you know, they they leave you waiting because you're like, I hope they explain it, which you know they will, but I... I actually really believed it. And also the last name Lodomus. Domus actually uh, means house inhabited by upper class. Um, because I knew Domus, once I yeah. saw that name, I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, I mean, of course, writers would make it all connected. But I just find all those facts very interesting. Yeah, it, it makes the, the levels and layers of the movie that much more fascinating. Yeah. But when you get to the end, I think it was wise and smart. And it was probably in the screenway that way, too. So the blinds get pulled. The sunlight comes in and everybody's like, "Oh God!" I knew it was bullshit. You know, it's so and then, funny. And then, and then the confetti, yeah, starts blowing, oh, popping. so lovely. And again, I didn't uh, when um, when uh, Aunt Helene, yes, like when she goes, God, I love her. gonna kill her," and then she explodes. I was like, "Okay, who took her out?" Yeah, like somebody took. I'm like, somebody took her out, who? right? Because I didn't see anybody else with a shotgun that would do that kind of damage. Mm-hmm. And then everybody else started uh, exploding, and then I was like, "What are they going to do with the kids? There's no way they're going right. to have the kids explode on." Oh, okay, they're going. They're boom, going boom, off. Boom. They're off. They're yeah. on camera. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's one of those rules: you don't kill kids uh, on camera. Which right. Friday the Thirteenth movies. Uh, clicked off every. Oh, you're giving us rules. Oh, well, we're gonna break this rule. This rule. Break but them this all. movie was. Uh, it was a good rated R fair. Gosh, yeah. I mean, it was so great. It, it kind of made me think, like, what game would you want to play if you had to play to death? And I'm like, no. I don't. I don't know. Uh, you know, like if it was a board game, because this is so such a board game thing, like they saw Clue or like, but you know, they, so yeah. it's like, what board game would you want to actually play to death? Not a type like this, but like old maid to death. Like if you had to choose, that's crazy. Shoots and ladders? Maybe? I don't, no. I got Candy Connect Land? 4? No. I don't know. No. God, I mean, I just would be like, let's yeah, end I'd it. Be, end be, it now. Yeah, I'd be out. Yeah, yeah I'd be yeah. out too. Yeah, and, and the hide and seek thing. You know? Yeah, but again, well, here's how come nobody's just yelling all y'all and nobody yells all y'all out? <laughs> come on out, come on out, everybody! Yeah, we're kidding. <laughs> yeah, then, but um, no, Samara, Samara weaving was fantastic as mm-hmm. Grace. He's absolutely right. I love again, coming from a director's mouth, he is right that the the the, the movie rests on her shoulders. Oh, no. Hundred percent. It had to be surrounded. Uh, everyone had to come around. Yeah, Grace. they had to, and they had. To, she had to carry uh, this movie. Which, by the way, is I was a huge fan of the Babysitter, mm-hmm. uh, another wonderful uh, twisted little movie. It's on Netflix, and of all people, McGee directed it. And I, you watch this movie, and it's equally as good. It's so good. I was wondering, this could have made money theatrically. Did you see the Babysitter? I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, it's no. very. She plays a babysitter. Yeah. She has uh, her favorite uh, kid. Yeah. And he has a mild crush on her, oh, but only to come to find out that she's part of some cult. And uh, he stu- he stumbles across this and 
they're trying to hunt him down and go, oh my God. So it's crazy. It, it, it has comedy. It blends horror. She is fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's a really fun movie. So I recommend if you have not seen The Babysitter, I believe it's still on Netflix. Go check it out. Samura Weaving's fantastic. I wanted to talk to you about Adam Brody. Yeah. Adam Brody to me, I'm watching this movie and he was genius to be cast and it made me wonder why... Are we not seeing him in more movies? He's he's good. I agree. Right? I well, I went to the I went to the movie with my friend and I was like, "Where's he been?" <laughs> yeah. Um. He and and I loved his character mm. Daniel specifically. I felt like his character choice. Um. I mean, Adam played it really really great, but that he specifically Daniel as the character brought in a really awful person for a wife because it shows his morality as a character of like I can't bring good into this, mm-hmm. so I'm gonna bring beauty, but just terrible um so i feel like when he's met daniel specifically with um samara's uh husband who is his brother alex alex brought in a a moral compass and daniel didn't know how to really deal with it Mm. and adam brody did a really great job of walking that line the threshold of it he really did and and, and to your point where's he been and I love this kind of casting yeah. because you're taking a chance. It's a studio, please, and I don't misunderstand. I mean no disrespect right. to Adam Brody, but you are. You're taking a chance. Yeah. You're, you're bringing in Andy McDowell's another one. Uh, so is in Henry Zerny. But Adam Brody, who's who had, he had a modicum of, of fame for a bit, you know, mm-hmm. and... But I was like, why isn't Hollywood utilizing him more? He can play some comedy. He obviously, in this movie, he was really good. It's not like he's a bad looking dude. So No, no. I mean he should I be would... used he should be used Hello? more. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Adam. Brody. So, yeah. yeah, Adam. So I I was he should be used more. And to to me, his casting uh too, because you you needed that for the brother. Yeah. And he in a sense was this defeated moral compass yeah that he had the moral compass but he's just i was bummed when he died yeah yeah me too i I mean because he 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 was the only one that actually had the balls to like be like oh i think i'm gonna try to help end it right and and let her go even whilst knowing it would be sacrificing the rest of them right yeah so he was really good henry cerny we were talking before i've loved this guy he's a character actor but he's always, you can always pick him up, but he was in the mm-hmm. Brian De Palma, the first Mission Impossible movie. He was uh, Ethan Hunt's, phylo- he was superior. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's that great scene. They have this great line of dialogue when they're in that like sushi restaurant or restaurant with the big fish tank that explodes. Uh, and he's he's just great. I would like to see him play against his type because he usually plays an asshole. Mm-hmm. He looks like he could play a good guy. I like I like seeing him. He's, I agree. he's one of my favorite character actors. And of course Andy McDowell. Yeah. You know, she's she's been around. I mean it's Andy McDowell. And, yeah. And yeah. so it's I always love seeing actors come into something that you really have not seen them be, in, in before. Like I would never picture I would I would picture her being in like a suspense movie, but not like a gory, bloody horror comedy kind of thing. So I like that she's on board because, again, it just lends something to the movie. And I like seeing, in a sense, new faces. I know she's not a new face. But but to the genre, she is. And on set, she literally said, all right, so listen, I've never thrown a punch in my life or on set. So can can we work this through before I go through this? And they had to kind of talk her through how to throw a punch and make it seem believable. And that's just, that's Andy McDowell. (laughs) Yep. And so if that's not more proof as to she's very a new face to this genre, or at least what she, the character she's playing, There you go. Which is kind of surprising because she was in Hudson Hawk. I mean, <laughs> not that that, not the five people who are watching right now, one of them watched that movie, and that's me. Uh, but it was kind of a Bruce Willis actioner. Uh, but it, again, you're right. It's great. I always love it when they bring in people that aren't, um, that you've never seen in the genre right. before. But old school. But old school. And it further proves that they love acting. And that they can act. Because if you can act, you should be able to do any genre. That's the way I look at it anyways. The silly way that I look at it. Well, I think we've really 
God, Tyler. Again, I, hey, can we get the applause uh, going there, uh-huh. Brian, please? He because was great. Te- well, no, Terry, you were great. Oh. Uh, that was a great get. I'll take it. I give you uh, all the credit in the world. Thank you. You you really made the show better. Not only, it wasn't just the guest, but you being on. Thank you very kindly. Thank you for having um, me. Love to have you on again. Yeah, love to uh, be back. We still have, well, summer's over. Eh, but we've got... Um, Is it? No. First day falls of. until September First something. First day falls until September. Uh, I know. Thank you so season. much, yeah. Ryan. I know, but for movies, it's kind of over. Summer movie season's yeah. over, but yeah. we got a lot okay. of great films yeah. for the fall. In fact, on uh, another episode we just put up today for Film Critics Weekly was a whole fall preview of festivals right. to come and big yeah. movies coming no, out. No, I so. can't wait because we'll be talking about some of those festivals. Festival Films, yours truly, first time, uh, first timer going to Toronto International Film Festival. Very excited, but we'll have it chapter two uh, yes. to talk to, to talk about uh, everything else that's coming out in the fall and going into the winter. You're you're welcome to come back. We'd love to have you so we can talk about all of these movies yeah. uh, at chapter two, which we'll do after Toronto. So take a week off because there's really nothing opening this week, anyways. I don't think. Is. No, not really. So take a week off, come back. People have seen it, chapter two. I think the conversation is mm-hmm. going to be great. So you're welcome, please. Yeah. Uh, it's worth talking about. Where can people find you? Guys, you can find me everywhere on the internet, Tara Erickson, especially on YouTube. That's T A R A E R I C K S O N. And you can find me right here on Popcorn Talk Network's Anatomy of a Movie, also uh, a, a, a host on Meet the Movie Press. And on the Twitters, at Dimitri Panos. Folks, thank you very much. Please comment on YouTube. Have an amazing Labor Day weekend. We'll be back to talk It Chapter 2 in a few weeks. Please go to the movies. Thank you very much to our guest, Tyler Gillette. And thank you for watching and listening. Bye, all. Have a great weekend. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit PopcornTalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network.